All right, I'm starting the official recording now. So yes, there will be a recording and I will make that available to everybody who signed up and even those that didn't. Um, I'm not 100% clear where I'm gonna put it. I'm probably gonna put it in the nerd buzz section of my new website. And obviously I'll, when I send the email out following up, I'll explain where that is for those who don't know. Um, so first of all, welcome to uh, Bulletproof Bookkeeping, a clean or clean a statement in less than 15 minutes. Um, I'm really excited and encouraged to see how many of you have uh, signed up for this. One person online had asked, is this the same stuff that's covered in the Bulletproof Bookkeeping course? And as I answered her on Facebook, it is a very, very, you know, a brief sort of scratch of the surface of what's covered much more deeply in the Bulletproof Bookkeeping course. The whole first section of the course is on banking and bank feeds, and this is like a little scratch out of that. You know, it goes much, much further than what I'm gonna be able to show you today in terms of how to start with what you can download from your bank in case for some reason you can't get the bank feeds working or your bank isn't included in the list or the connection breaks and Intuit says it's the bank and the bank says it's Intuit. There are ways around all that. Um, and while I'm talking about it, I'll address one of the questions we got uh, from somebody uh, when they registered, you know, which was the question of, should I even be using the bank feeds? Um, she says, are live bank feeds worth it in QBO? I haven't turned ours on yet because I'm still skeptical. Uh, my very honest and direct answer to that question is that to me, the bank feeds are like the whole point of using a product like QBO. It is the whole thing centers around the bank feeds. I use the bank feeds a lot in desktop. Um, in fact, by the time I you know, did sort of move everything over to QBO, I was exclusively using bank feeds in desktop. The bank feeds in QBO, in my opinion, are much more robust, much more efficient. That's, and that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. It, it increases efficiency dramatically. And I don't believe it exposes anything security-wise any more than it's already exposed, right? Your bank account's in the cloud. You're accessing your banking website directly in the clouds. And you're using the same credentials when you link up the bank feed in QBO. So not only um, do I think it's worth it, I, I, I would almost go as far as to say, if you're not gonna use the bank feeds, then you're not really getting the benefits of QBO. You might as well stay with desktop. Right, And certainly if you're entering everything manually, which I assume would have to be the case if you're not using the bank feeds, um, you, let's put it this way, there's definitely substantial room to get much more efficient. And the, the name of the game these days, and, and hopefully we've uh, learned this by now in the accounting world, we've certainly seen enough of it, is um, we're hopefully not charging by the hour anymore, we're charging flat monthly fees. Because if you're charging by the hour and then you do adopt these kinds of technologies, you're gonna get the job done in a lot less time, which means if you're charging by the hour, you're losing your shirt, so to speak, right? So um, I definitely think it's worth it. Um, and like I said, I think that's really kind of the whole point of it in a, in a manner of speaking, is um, that everything sort of centers around the bank feeds and branches out from there. The whole concept and one of the things I plan on underscoring today is that the, uh, um, you know, by using the bank feeds and then matching everything with what's downloaded at the bank, but then ultimately still reconciling the statement too, that's a big part of how you get the books bulletproof because that's the process by which you're confirming that absolutely everything that cleared the bank account and any credit card accounts, uh, that everything absolutely is accounted for and that there are no differences. We never plug numbers and I'm going to get into why that's so important, even if it's just a small difference. So, um, but just kind of taking it from the top here. Um, Greg, if you don't mind, I've made you a co-host, so keep your eyes out for people coming in as attendees. I made one of you a co-host. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm on it. Um, All right, cool, I, there's I nobody in there a, now. But I just got a funky configuration because I'm in a coffee shop right now. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so first, fair warning, this is, this is gonna be one of the worst sales webinars you'll ever watch. Um, you know, if, if you want to call it that. I'm supposed to give you a lot of the what to do, but, but not the how. Uh, sales and marketing professionals teach you not to teach anything, but as any of you who know me know, that's, that's what I do. I teach. You know, they want to teach you to save that for when people have paid for something, but I've always been a rule breaker, and I honestly can't imagine a better way to prove myself anyway than to teach you something you can use today without having to give me a dime. And obviously I do a lot of that by way of, you know, all the videos I upload to YouTube and Vimeo and the stuff that I put out there on my website, you know, just for fun and for free, as I like to say. Um, 
so I can't imagine a better way to prove myself than to actually show you, you know, what I have and what I have to offer. And uh, when you see what I'm going to show you today, I'm pretty sure you'll want to spend more time with me one way or the other. And that's kind of the goal here. And, you know, even if you don't sign up and pay for something that I offer, just hanging out. Most of us hang out together online, the Facebook group between Wall and Main Strategy Forum and um, a number of people here who are in the 97 and Up program. And a number of you actually I recognize are already signed up for Bulletproof Bookkeeping with QuickBooks Online. Um, so uh, we're scheduled for an hour today, but like I said, it's, I don't think it'll take that long, you know, but I'm happy to spend the whole hour answering as many questions as any of you might have. Um, and after today, if, you, you know, if you're an accountant or a bookkeeper, you, you might want to join my 97 and Up program if you haven't already, where we do this kind of thing twice a week and, and then all week long in Slack. Um, and if you're a business owner, then I definitely think you're going to want my Bulletproof Bookkeeping resource. Ultimately, today's webinar is designed to give you a taste, really, of what I offer in much greater depth and detail in uh, well over 13 hours of video and more to come, as many of you know. Uh, in fact, uh, like I said, I recognize a bunch of you are already signed up. Um, and I know you're here because you know that today I'm going to offer some additional, some kind of an additional perspective, some uh, nuggets, as the term is, that we like to use. Um, you know, so hopefully you'll, those of you who are in the course will find that there's something still sort of new and refreshing uh, offered here today. Um, and in the course, of course, I'll, you know, I, I take what, like I said, I take what you, you're going to see today a lot, a lot further. Um, and then stick around because at the end of this, I am going to offer something to those of you who haven't already signed up yet and might be inclined to want to. Um, so I'll go over that at the end of the webinar. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, whether you're an accountant or bookkeeper with no accounting background, you'll want to learn what I'm showing you today because it will make you more efficient and more effective, right? You're going to get your bank recs done in perhaps a fraction of the time that it may already be taking you today, specifically because of what I'm showing you and especially when there's a difference. Um, you know, and, and the business owner who's doing their own bookkeeping for now will want to learn this to save time so you can focus on what you really went into business to do, which of course, I assume is not the bookkeeping necessarily, right? Uh, and the accountant or bookkeeper will want to learn this because hopefully by now you've learned to charge monthly fees and not hourly. And by charging monthly fees, um, uh, it's in both yours and your client's interest to get this stuff done a lot faster so you can focus on the more value-added services like the analysis and strategy, right? Either way, nobody wants to spend a lot of time reconciling bank statements and credit card accounts, but we have to. And here's why I sort of, uh, you know, uh, hinted at this already. This is the very foundation of how we get bulletproof books. If you've got a difference when you're reconciling, no matter how small it is, you absolutely must find it. And, and the minute you plug a number, then where financial reports are unreliable, because it means something is either missing or incorrect, right? And a lot of people will say, and I've seen, I've seen CPAs in these discussions on Facebook over the years saying things like, oh, it's not worth spending the time looking for a small difference. Well, I've often shared the story. I'll give you the short version today of years ago when I had a client, when I was still going on site to see clients and everybody was still in QuickBooks desktop and the client didn't want me spending any time researching a hundred dollar difference. First of all, it was exactly a hundred dollar difference and which was odd to me. It was sort of oddly even to me, if you know what I mean, get it, see what I did there. Um, but it was exactly a hundred dollars and long story short, I agreed that I wouldn't charge them if I didn't find the difference in 30 minutes, but within 30 minutes, I found the difference and it was two transactions. One was a payment for $9,900 and one was a totally unrelated deposit for $10,000. So the, the net effect of the material misstatement on the financial statements would have been close to $20,000 if I hadn't taken the time to search out what that little hundred dollar difference was, right? So just because the difference looks small doesn't mean that it is. And bottom line, the only way I know for sure that not a single transaction has been missed and that not a single transaction has the wrong amount associated with it is by reconciling without ever plugging a number. And that's the other main point I wanna show you today is how in under 15 minutes you can cut up a bank statement and quickly find a difference if there is one. Um, so the bottom line, the process I'm going to teach you today will make it easy to ensure that you can find any difference in under 15 minutes, and I don't care how many transactions you have, right? The math on this is very simple. Assuming we have the premise of the foundation of what I've just laid out, then it's very simple math. The beginning balance plus additions minus subtractions equals the ending balance. And I realize that's almost overly academic, but it's an important thing to remember because it speaks directly to the fact that if there's a difference, it can be found and it should be able to be found 
quickly. If your beginning balance is off, then you should undo the reconciliation and go back as far as you need to until the, balance, the beginning balance does match. Because again, with the process I'm going to show you, it won't matter. It won't be a whole lot of extra time to fix it and sort of get it done right. So you keep undoing until you go back, you know, obviously within a certain reasonable limit. If you get back to the beginning of the year and last year's tax returns filed, then fine. At that point, I would say, you know, uh, post an adjustment to get last year's books to agree to the tax return should have been done anyway. And then we can roll forward from there. Um, so there's, there's obviously certain sort of uh, reasonableness limitations on this. But if I had to, even today in October, I would go back to the beginning of this year and re-reconcile every month if I had to, if my beginning balance was off. Um, then you can use this process to re-reconcile everything properly. And if your beginning balance matches, which that's the point of, of what I just said, is to make sure that the beginning balance does match, then the formula above will work every single time. It's a mathematical principle. It was true a thousand years ago, and it will still be true a thousand years from now, right? Again, beginning balance plus additions minus subtractions equals ending balance. I'm looking in the chat, and Greg says, if you've re recently connected or reconnected a bank fee, QBO often adds a record solid transaction, which I always go and remove because it's almost always going to be incorrect, right? So that yes, that's true. That could, uh, that could fix it. Um, but I always, because I know that, I always go in and, and I immediately and automatically practically remove that beginning balance transaction that the QBO bank feeds post because it's almost always going to be wrong. They're just looking at what the balance per bank was as of the furthest day back that it was able to go. And if you've already got activity that you've been entering and reconciling and now you're just linking up the bank feeds, it's never going to be right, you know, and you're never going to want that entry. <laughs> Maybe try unmuting the other you. Okay, all right, we'll come back to Greg when we can. Um, so again, if your beginning balance matches and the formula above will work always. Uh, bottom line, when you reconcile like this, you have a rock solid foundation in all of your bookkeeping and financial reporting that nothing is missing and no amounts are off. And that to me is the very foundation of what it means to have what I call bulletproof books, right? An example of this where this is really important and uh, powerful, let's say, is when you're reviewing your receivables and you know that you have the foundation of everything I've just explained about reconciling and no, I'm not sharing my screen yet. We'll get there, I promise. Um, but no, there's nothing for me to share on this. So again, going back, an example of what I'm talking about where it's really important to have this foundation of having the reconciliations rock solid, the way I described, is let's say you're reviewing your receivables and you're looking, let's say I'm the accountant, I'm looking with my business owner client at the open receivables report and, we, and the owner says, points out an item and says, I know absolutely this item was paid. Well, if I know that we've reconciled everything without ever plugging a number because that's the rule, then I know that payment is in there somewhere. And it's just a matter of searching it out, finding it was obviously misclassified. We find the payment and we get it applied to the invoice instead of however it was recorded. Usually when that happens, it's because somebody got the deposit and recorded it and posted it directly to income. And that means we've doubled our income, overstated our accounts receivable. Uh, you know, and, and so it's like the, the problems just go on and on. So again, because I know that we've got rock solid, we've got a rock solid reconciliation process, there can't be anything missing. I know that payment's in there somewhere. All I have to do is find it and get it applied to that invoice and the problem is solved, right? So uh, if you also know that nothing's been omitted from your books and everything's recorded at the right amounts, then you know with certainty that everything's there. And, and so if something's off, it's just a question of classification, like I said finding it and fixing it. And usually you can do that in under 15 minutes. Uh, so first a disclaimer here, because we're gonna be looking at some Excel stuff. And I understand not all of you are going to be as fast as I am with Excel. That will improve with time and experience, I promise you. And uh, even the slowest among you should still have no problem getting this layout done that I'm gonna show you in under five minutes, really. And the rest should not take any of you more than 10 minutes in terms of actually then using what I'm gonna show you to find any differences, if there are any. Um, so let's take a look, and now I will share my screen so I can show you a little bit of what I'm talking about. All right, first of all, say hi to Zena. She just recently passed away, unfortunately. 
So the first thing we want to do, and sorry, I'm just moving some things around my screen and Excel is giving me a hard time. The first thing we want to do is we need to get a CSV file, right? So let me find that here. Um, I've got a couple of things I want to show you, just in case we have you know, people among us who don't necessarily understand 100% what that means. Every single bank account out there, I don't care who they are, uh, let's put it this way. If they don't have the option to download your banking in a common delimited or CSV or Excel format, it's time to change banks. There's a lot of things I can accept. I get a lot of banks, you know, if you want to work with your local credit union because you want to support the credit union, that's fine. I respect that. But even your small little local credit unions should have the ability to download your transactions in a CSV format. And especially in a case like that, you better be able to do this so that you can you know, import that stuff and usurp the bank feeds uh, in QBO um, exactly in the way that I mentioned we walk you through in the course. So bottom line, if you go into the area wherever you go to normally get your statements or to download activity, you should absolutely find a section with options like the ones you see here. This is obviously Wells Fargo, where you can get Quick and QuickBooks, the old QuickBooks format. Remember the .iif? I'm surprised that's actually still available even. Um, and then the comma delimited is what you're looking for. Some banks will actually say Excel, right? Notice here it says ASCII or spreadsheet, right? So you're looking for anything along those lines, either a CSV, which stands for comma separated value, or it says spreadsheet, or some kind of a generic format like that, that you know you can open up in a spreadsheet, okay? Now, when you do that, it's going to look something like this. This is actually uh, real data from one of my business checking accounts that I was using in 2018. And what I did, in fact, was I didn't just download one month. I downloaded the entire year. Now, normally, if you're just trying to deal with one month, I'm going to show you how that works even when you have the whole year in here. But the thing to keep in mind is that most bank accounts will have a drop down when you're going to download this that will allow you to choose a statement period. So you can download a CSV specific to that statement period. If it doesn't offer you that option, then you can certainly customize the date range. Notice in my Wells Fargo screenshot, it had that up here, where you can just manually put in the exact date range. Obviously you want them conforming to what the statement period is, right? And uh, most banks are pretty good about keeping your bank accounts on a uh, strict calendar month. Credit cards, usually not so much, it just depends. Sometimes you can even call the credit card company and ask them to switch you to a calendar month basis. Some will do it, some will not. Bank accounts, you can almost certainly do that. If for some reason they just started you off based on the date that you opened the account and kept you on that kind of a cycle, you can call them up and get them switched to a calendar month. It will just help make things easier and cleaner to do that where possible. So here's the part you really wanna pay attention to because this is really what it all comes down to. Let's say I'm in QuickBooks Online and I'm going to reconcile and I'm off. And you know, one of the great things about QuickBooks Online is that if you're really good about the bank feeds and keep them up to date, and if, you don't have, if you're not writing too many checks, that's the one thing that might not match up is a check you've written that's in QuickBooks that hasn't been cashed yet, right? I very rarely write checks anymore. Um, I think I write one check a year to AAA to renew my vehicle registration because they don't take any other form of payment for that purpose. Um, anyway, so if you do that, it's you, most of your reconciliations are going to be like two clicks, right? Because it's already preliminarily checked off the things that it matched up with the banking. So oftentimes I put in the statement ending date, the ending balance, and everything's matched up and my difference is already zero and I can just click finish now, right? But if there is a difference, that's when I invoke this process that I'm going to show you. I've learned not to even waste time trying to figure it out. If it takes me more than like five seconds, I'm going here. I'm going to the bank's website. I'm downloading the CSV file. And it will look something like this. Obviously, every bank varies a little bit with respect to the columns. But when you open up that CSV file, it's just a generic text file. There's going to be no formatting, nothing, right? So I'm going to take this CSV. And the first thing I'm going to do is save it into an actual Excel file, right? So I just changed the file type to a full Excel workbook. And if I'm doing it for a particular month, then I'll probably append the title with something like 2018 if it's March, it'll be 03 31. Right? So I name my files very carefully. I'm very consistent. The PDF for the statement for the same month is going to be named exactly the same way. So the only difference is one is .pdf and the other one is .xlsx, right? I'm very meticulous about this stuff because it saves me a ton of time later if I ever have to go looking for something. 
right? So in this case, as I mentioned, I actually took the whole year of 2018. So I'll click save. And the main reason for doing that and remembering to do that first is because if you leave it in CSV and you've started formatting stuff, you lose the formatting. The CSV format will not retain your formatting, right? So really important to do that first and foremost. The next thing I'll do is I'll just notice my cell pointer is up here at A1. I just moved it up. On the date column where every line in the file pretty much has to have a date, I'll hit control and the down arrow. I wanna get clear about where the end of the file is. And I'll make sort of a mental note. Okay, I've got 1,704 lines in here. Because the next thing I wanna do is highlight the entire range. And so I'm gonna control up arrow back up so I get back to the top. And then, so I'm gonna give you some keyboard commands. I promised that I would teach you some really cool Excel stuff. So if you're taking notes, definitely take this stuff down, right? Control shift and down arrow will select everything down. So it will select the whole range all the way down and control shift right arrow next will select across, okay? And so if I manually now scroll up to the top, just so you can see what I've done, and seeing the header sort of helps. You can see I've selected all the columns across. Column E is a little bit narrow, so everything's bleeding over, and we'll fix that. But I've selected everything down and everything across. So I've got all the data in the range of what I've downloaded selected, okay? And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I wanna convert this to a table. And the quick way to do that is to press Control and the letter T like table. As soon as I do that, it gives me this dialog confirming the range. But since I've got it selected already, I don't have to worry. I know it's got the exact range I've selected. The other important thing is just to make sure that this box is checked off here where it says my table has headers. Okay, so I'll click OK. It turns it into a table. And then I want to get this widened up so I can see everything. So I'm just gonna click this little uh, box that's kind of in the corner between the A and the one, between column A and row one. And that's a quick way to get the entire spreadsheet selected. And while I've got the whole spreadsheet selected, I'm gonna move my mouse. It doesn't matter, I can move it between any two columns. You'll notice how my cell pointer changes or, or my mouse changes shape into that little plus sign looking thing. While it's got that shape to it, it means it's ready to do something in between the columns. If I double click, it automatically resizes all the columns to make them as wide or narrow as they need to be to fit the data, right? So it auto sizes the columns to fit the data when I do this. And then I can click anywhere else to click away. And now I can see my spreadsheet it starts to look a little bit cleaner, but we're gonna do a couple more things. Notice while I have the table created, there'll be a new tab here that says table design, right? And so if you don't love this default color convention, you can change it, you have color palettes here. And for some of you, it might sound silly, but if you're spending a lot of time in this stuff, it really does help to make it visually appealing to you, whatever that might mean, right? So just know that that's there. The next thing I'm always going to do is I'm going to format the dates, right? So, because I want them very consistent. So underneath the date column header itself, I'm gonna start there at A2. Control shift down arrow once again will select all the way down. And then control and the number one brings up your format cells dialog. So that's control and the numeral one. Don't use the one if you have one of those little number pads on the right, use the one that goes across the top of your keyboard. That one works for sure. The other number one on the number pad won't always work for this. And then I just want a very consistent convention. So I want the double digit month, day, and year. That way everything lines up beautifully. It helps me to read what I'm looking at. It's much cleaner. So I'll do that. And then let's take the amounts. And again, control the number one. And I want them as numbers. I want the comma separator. And I want negative numbers in red. I just want it real clear where there's a negative number. Okay. We're not importing today, right? We're not going to import any transactions, but one important note, if your plan is to import this data, then this number, this uh, formatting convention for negative numbers won't work. You'll need to just use a simple negative sign in front of the number if you're doing that. <coughs> now, we're almost there. We're actually almost done. I mentioned that we're going to use March uh, of 2018 as the example. So let's say it's March's reconciliation that I'm off on, okay? Here's what I do. Now that I've got everything formatted looking beautiful, in my date column, what you may have noticed is that when I, turned, when I turned it into a table, 
it put these little drop down arrows at the right side of each column. So in the date column, I'm going to click this drop down and I'm going to, un I'm going to uncheck where it says select all and I'm going to check off, I only want March. Keeping in mind, this assumes we have a calendar month and, this, and then this works beautifully every time. I'll click OK. And now notice it's got me just looking at the month of March. Next thing I'll do, because when we're reconciling, especially if you're familiar with the QBO reconciliation, um, you now can sort of filter the reconciliation screen to focus just on the additions or just on the subtractions. So what I wanna do is I wanna sort this by amount so I can do the same thing here. So we'll go to data. And while my cell pointer is in the amount column, I'll just click the, uh, actually in this case, because negative numbers, I'll start with this kind of a sort. I guess you could do it either way, right? But here's the kicker. Let's say I wanna focus. So here's my um, cutout of the bank statement for that month, right? Beginning balance, I have 28,000 in deposits and credits and 27,000 in withdrawals and debits. I'm rounding, of course, there, right? So let's say I wanna focus just, the, oftentimes the deposits and credits match up. That's usually the case. Usually when you're off, it's gonna be on the subtractions, the withdrawals and debit side. So what I wanna do is I wanna focus just on the stuff that's less than zero. So after I've done the date filter on the month, I can sort of incrementally add a filter on the amount. When I click the drop down arrow, you'll find this number filters option here. And I want everything that's less than zero. So I'm gonna choose the less than filter. I'm gonna put zero in there. So it's gonna filter it further and only show me the stuff that's in March that's less than zero. And you didn't see any difference here because I'd already sorted it by amount. Now, uh, a descending sort works because I want the sort of uh, lowest negative number, or highest negative number first, because then I can sort it the same exact way in QuickBooks Online's reconciliation screen. And now I can quickly go line by line and compare this. And believe me, even if it's a lot of transactions, it usually only, it never takes me more than 15 minutes to get through this and figure out where there might be a transaction that was missing. And where it comes up most often is a case like this where I have three transactions for $25. This is where I've seen things get screwy, if anything, um, is in QuickBooks Online, you might only have one of these transactions or just two of them, you might be missing one. So another thing that's really handy, especially doing it this way, is if I have multiple transactions for the same amount, first of all, because I'm working with it sorted by amount, they're gonna all be together. But if I have like three is easy to spot, but sometimes you'll have 10 transactions for the same amount. If you pay attention, while I've got all the transactions for the same amount highlighted, look down at the very bottom of my screen, you'll see it gives me a count. It shows me that there's three. And what I'll do at that point while I'm checking it off in QuickBooks Online and I get to the same group of $25 transactions is I'll count out loud, people think I'm nuts, as I check them off, because I know I need to count three. And if I click one, two, and then it's done, then I know I'm missing a transaction. And then of course, I look at the dates here versus the dates in QBO to figure out which one I'm actually missing, right? Because they're not necessarily, and you certainly can't assume that they're gonna be the same thing. These are all different. I have MailChimp, I have uh, Intuit for something, and I have sfvca.org, right? So, you know, just because it's the same amount doesn't assume that, you know, should never assume that it's the same thing. It could be the same thing, you know, recurring or whatever, but even then most of those things are monthly recurring. So you should still only see them once in any given month. Right. Um, that's funny. Here's where I was using transaction pro. Right. And I had two different subscriptions I was paying for with them. So that's the one thing that can make it the most challenging to find the difference. Right. And, and I just gave you the solution for how to find it. You can select, all the transactions that are the same amount, get the count here in Excel. Now I've got four $50 transactions, then I'm checking them off in QBO and I just go click, 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 click. And if I don't count four clicks while I'm doing it in QBO, then I know something's off. If I count a fifth, then I have something extra. Maybe somehow I duplicated a transaction in QBO. We all know how that can happen. I manually enter it and then I also add it in from the bank feeds and now I've got two of the same transactions, right? These things can happen and they do. And I wanna show you another thing that you can do with this to, to sort of triple confirm that your data is accurate. So again, while we have the table selected, we have our table design dialog and we can check off this box that says total row. When I check off this box that says total row, I'm gonna control down arrow to get to the bottom. So notice I'm still, you know, I'm only looking at March and right underneath the amount column, notice it gives me a drop down, So I can choose which function I want. Obviously I want the sum function. 
So it's totaling up, and I'll widen the column. It gives me a total of 26,945.79. Survey says 26,945.79. So that's how I can confirm that I've got the right cutoff, that everything from the statement is, in fact, included here. And in this way, like I said, I, when I compare this with what's in QBO and I have everything sorted by the amount, it honestly takes me usually no more than five minutes to just whip through it and, you know, I'll unselect everything in QBO and just go click, click, click down the line. Like here's a whole bunch of $300 transactions, right? So it's a good example of what I was talking about where I'll just highlight the range and say, okay, the count says eight. I need to make sure I've got eight of these in QBO as I'm checking these off, right? So, I mean, that's the gist of it. And then certainly if I'm off on the additions, I can simply go back in here without having to change anything else except the number filter and say, now show me everything that's greater than zero, right? And I can quickly jump down to the bottom, 28, 116, 11, 28, 116, 11. So what I found is more, certainly much more so than by date, when I've got this stuff sorted by the amount of the transaction, it makes it super fast and easy to find where the difference is coming from and then get it fixed. If I'm missing a transaction in QBO, obviously I added, if I've got something extra, then I'll simply void or delete it. Any questions? Okay, so if there's no questions, then I'll show you a few more cool little tricks that you can do while we're here, right? And I recently covered this. Uh, it wasn't long ago I did a Zoom call um, on doing like cleanup jobs, right? So where you're catching up and you have six months worth of data to clean up. So let's go in here and I'm gonna go over to data. And I'm just gonna clear the filters because I've got a filter applied on the dates and a filter applied on the amount. And after a while, if you're playing around in this, you can kind of get lost in you know, what I filtered and how I filtered it. So I'm gonna hit clear and that just resets all the filters. So now I know for sure I'm seeing everything. Okay, and let's say I wanna identify all of the uh, transactions that are from Best Buy, right? The, you've all, I'm sure, noticed that when you download transactions from a lot of these places, they don't always come in consistently with the same exact description. They might have a store number appended in there. They might have like a date sort of coded into the description, right? Um, uh, and so actually I'm looking at the chat. I saw the chat come up. So Alexa's is asking, what about importing this into QBO? So that's not the subject of today's lesson, but I'm, I'm about to show you exactly some tricks that I use for that. And, and again, this is deeply covered in the Bulletproof Bookkeeping course. So if I'm actually planning to import this, I'll add an extra column here for the QuickBooks payee and for the QuickBooks account, right? Because I'll do all the coding right here in Excel. And one tip for how to get that done quickly is in this filter dropdown, I can search for anything that's got the words Best Buy in it. At least I know that much is going to be included. And notice it shows you in the results, it's got a whole bunch of Best Buy auto payments. So I click OK. And if I'm coding this for an import, then I just go into the column for the QuickBooks payee and I code them all to best buy the payee. And you know, these are monthly payments, you know, pretty much recurring monthly payments on a best buy account. So the QuickBooks account that would get coded to would be the best buy credit card account, right? To pay off the credit card for whatever computer equipment or whatever it is that may have been bought. So using the filter search is a great way to chisel this list down and look for things. Um, especially if instead of today's use case, which was simply to find a difference on a reconciliation super quick. Um, but if you're, again, if you're trying to prepare this for import, you know, this is one of the keys to that whole process, right? And I, like I said, in the course, we walk through this much, much more slowly. And, uh, and I go through the actual process of getting a whole statement coded. I think I actually coded this whole year's file in the, in the course, if I remember correctly. And then, uh, and then I show you how to use SASANT, Excel transactions, to map and import this directly into QBO. And when you do that kind of import, you're actually usurping the bank beats. And what the course actually does on that is it shows you, because prior to doing this part, I've actually already done the import of the uh, transactions into the bank feed. So that CSV file we started with, you can actually take that and import that file as is right into the QBO bank feeds area. And then it's the same as if your bank account was linked up and you just coded, or if you have rules in there, those rules will get applied, 
So in the course, I show all that, and then I show the import process. And the real kicker, the really cool part of it is, because I had already done the direct import into the bank feeds area, when I do the upload through SASANT, everything just matches up. And then it's, and it's all done in a second. So in, in the course, you'll see how I get pretty much this whole year's, whole year's worth of data imported and coded in QuickBooks Online in I, like well under an hour. You know, I forget what the exact uh, time frame is on that. Um, but that's the most, uh, probably the most powerful trick I can show you in terms of chiseling a file like this down to get it coded quickly as to who's the payee that's going to be in QuickBooks and, and what account does that go to. Okay, so no more questions? I'll give you all a second to see if you can unmute or post in the chat. Told you it wasn't going to take the whole hour. Okay, everyone's quiet. Either I put everybody to sleep or everybody's just blown away. <laughs> um, <clears throat> All right, so before I explain, I mentioned at the beginning that I was gonna throw out an offer for those of you who haven't already signed up for Bulletproof Bookkeeping. The bad news is it's not gonna be as good as I had before. I'm, I'm not gonna give it to you for half price. Um, the price of the course is now $1,000, right? It was 500 while I was pre-selling it. And now it's a thousand, but here's what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm going to keep this offer active until the end of this month. But before I show you the actual offer, in case some of you haven't actually seen this already, I want to show you the outline of the course, which is done in Airtable. So here's the bank feed section, which, like I said, what we just went over today is sort of scratching the surface of what's in here. You know, the obvious is connecting the bank accounts and then setting up detailed rules, which is how you substantially automate a lot of the bookkeeping. So going back to the question somebody had about, is it worth it? Not only is it worth it, but if you do the QBO bank feed and you learn how to write really good rules, and they're not hard, um, you'll, you can practically automate the whole bookkeeping process. You'll go in once a week. There'll be like maybe three transactions that aren't covered by rules that you then, then you create the rules for them. So I have one client who has, I'm not even kidding, he has like six bank accounts and at least six credit card accounts. And I spend less than 15 minutes once a week updating his bank feeds. And hold on, let me find the chat. Um, Lisa says, excellent Excel tricks. They make the job so much easier. Curious how many people here are not in the course. Um, so that is an interesting question. Well, I could tell you, but anyway. Um, so you learn how to set up the rules, right? And then there's a lesson here on how the order that the rules are in is very important. And I go over some of the implications there that if they're in a certain order and there's any kind of conflict, the first rule wins, right? So that's important to be aware of when you're setting up your rules. And then here is where we actually code the CSV statement to import it directly. And it's broken up into two segments. We do one segment to show you how to do the money out which are the payments, and another a lesson to show you how to do the money in, which is obviously the deposit. So, you know, and it's, it has to be done as separate imports. And then this is the lesson that shows you how to import your banking directly into the register with SASANT Excel transactions. That's the name of the product is SASANT Excel transactions. And then once all that's done, you'll see how you can reconcile your bank account in five minutes or less, because pretty much at that point, when you um, select everything that's cleared, you're going to be balanced. The only thing that might throw you off, like I said earlier, is uh, if you have checks that you've written that haven't cleared the bank yet, and you have to make sure that those are not checked off. Um, so, uh, oh, so Lisa's asking in the chat. She wants to. She wants to pull all of you. So, if you just in the chat, put either yes or no. If you're, uh, if you know, obviously yes. If you've signed up for bulletproof bookkeeping, and no, if you haven't. Um, so. Then, of course, I go over, you know, some reports to review after you've updated the bank feeds. Uh, the big one is the uh, uncleared transactions report, which is really important to do, especially going back to keeping the books bulletproof. We want to make sure there aren't any really old uncleared transactions, which, of course, could indicate, you know, something that needs to be followed up on. Somebody never cashed their check or maybe it was a duplicated transaction. We cleared off the one and we left the duplicate uncleared. You know, and these things obviously throw our register balance off. So we want to keep that clean. I never like to have anything more than maybe six months old at the most, you know, as an uncleared item in a bank account. And so, so I go over, you know, 
generally what to review and then a specific lesson on how to create the uncleared transactions report, right? And, and so this section alone is almost three hours of video that it gives you. It's a real deep dive. I know Lisa's here with us. I know she's taken the course. So uh, Lisa can um, probably say a few words. She always speaks very well of me and my course. That's um, why I'm, I'm unmuted. So when you're done speaking, I'd like okay. to speak. Because I do see there are several no's in here, a lot of no's. Yep, there's definitely some no's in there. So, you know, I hope you'll consider it. Um, and in another minute, I'll explain what my offer is going to be, which uh, hopefully it's an offer you can't refute. Okay. Well, before you go on, I would like to say a few things if that's okay. Can I have? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I see there's a lot of no's in here, and um, I I signed up for the course at the very beginning when Seth first put this out, and I can just tell you it's well worth the money. It even if you're an experienced bookkeeper, you're going to get something out of this. And the beginning part, you know, where Seth goes through the the as he's showing here you here on the screen, you know, just the bank reconciliations but they're not normal bank reconciliations you get to do them Seth style <laughs> so <laughs> he shows you how to how to speed it up as you saw you get a lot of Excel tips and tricks that you can take into other parts of your practice um, I would encourage you to go through every single step because even if you're experienced there's as we've come to call these nuggets that Seth throws out there in his teachings they're little unexpected things that you'll learn that um, will help you do your job better um, the other beautiful thing about this course that you're not going to get in any other course is, um, I, ex I explained this a couple weeks ago, when you buy a training material or a, a book and you're going to learn, you don't get to speak to the author. You read your material and you're done. Seth is always available to us. Additionally, this, he, this is a growing program. He's not done. He's got it all in here and you got it from A to Z. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's A to Z. It's all there. But as things change, as they do with QuickBooks a lot, if you're a QuickBooks user, you know that, he will be updating this. So he'll let us know when it's updated. So it's a live training. I, I don't think it's ever going to stop. I, there's a community center. Actually, Seth just brought this up. I actually was just looking through here over the weekend and, and got a, a great tip from somebody who was going back and forth with Seth on something, and I jotted it down. And then he actually followed up with me and gave me some additional information. So we collaborate. We talk together. Um, it yep, is, if if, yeah, there I am. So, um, I, I just, I think it's, you know, we spend money and we go to conferences and we spend the airfare and the hotels and we go in and we learn a lot and it's a lot to take in and, and, and we then come back to our, our lives and we don't get to see that speaker again and, and we might forget or not implement it and then forget how to use it. This is, this is having access to your teacher 365 days a year. And I say that because Seth is really good. <laughs> about responding in 24 to, to 48 hours. And he will personally reach out and address any questions you have on a particular situation you have yourself, or if it's just something he's taught in the course. So I just can't recommend it enough. It's probably gonna be the best dollars you spend on um, training that you will do for your business. Thank you, Lisa. And I swear I didn't pay her to say that. I probably should. Um, <laughs> So yeah, and I'm going to send you all the link to this outline so you can go through it on your own time, um, you know, and, and take a look and see it. it but it, like Lisa said, it's A to Z. The last section, uh, I have a detailed section on what I call management reports. So it's all the reports I run, some obvious, some may be less obvious. Um, and then I have a separate section on owner's equity that I think is important. I think it gets overlooked and, it's, and it shouldn't be overlooked as much as it is. And then here's a whole lesson I did that's 25 minutes on how to catch up your books. It's kind of like a recap of everything above and how to apply everything you've learned in the whole course so far when you're needing to catch up the books for six or 12 months or whatever it might be. And then um, this one, this section is aimed well, I, I was going to say it's aimed at the bookkeeper who's doing it for clients, but that's not necessarily true because it's really even the business owner may want to have a monthly checklist that they work through, you know, in maintaining the books. And, and so either way, I was going to say it's aimed at the bookkeeper, but I take that back. Business owner or bookkeeper or accountant, you should go through this because it's going to show you how once you've got everything dialed in and bulletproof, this is how you keep it that way right? By doing a regular monthly review. And as the business owner, this is also where you're going to get tremendous insights into what's off or, you know, what can be done with or about the information that's there. So I'm going to send all this out to you. And now I'm sure some of you are dying to know what my offer is here. So 
here it is. If you go on to my website at new.nerdenterprises.com, and real quick, because I just remembered when I went over to the other tab, generally speaking, first thing every day, I, I look through the notifications for any new comments in that community, which is tied to the course. So you sign up for the course, you get access to the community as well. And it's pretty much the first thing I do every day. So I try to make sure that any question that gets asked is answered in well under 24 hours, right? So, so it's, you know, there's one guy who was in there who was asking very specific questions about a transaction he needed to learn how to post for a nonprofit he was working with. And he actually posted a link to the Intuit community's answer, and he just wanted my clarification on whether, A, did I agree with their method of doing it, which I did, and B, you know, he showed me a couple of screenshots. He wanted to make sure that it looked like he had done it right, and he needed clarification on one thing. And we went back and forth throughout the better part of a day, I think, but it was great. I love this. I love that it gives me the ability to do that for you because I can post screenshots. I don't know if you saw as I was scrolling through. I can even embed videos. So this way you don't have to go hunting around YouTube to find a video. Somebody was asking about customer deposits. I said, that's one of the things I'm going to add into the course that's not in there yet but I'm absolutely going to add a section on the whole customer deposit cycle. But in the meantime, I just gave them the link to the video that I did on it a couple of years back that's on YouTube. But this way you don't have to go hunting for it. So, so at least I really appreciate what you said. It's you underscored what I've been trying to accomplish with this, which is to provide a very live interactive resource so that, you know, and it's lifetime access. You're paying once and it's yours forever. So um, real quick, if you go here and just click on courses and you'll find among other things, Bulletproof Bookkeeping with QuickBooks Online. The base price now is $997. You're gonna use the code BB25, Bulletproof Bookkeeping. So B is in boy, B is in boy, the number two, the number five. And that's gonna get you 25% off on the course, right? So right off the bat, you'll get it for 750 instead of a thousand, roughly rounding there. Uh, remember, there's also a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you get in here and you don't think it's worth $997 or even $747, whatever you paid for it, let me know. I'll refund 100% of your money. Um, and then the other thing I'm willing to throw out there, it, for those of you who sign up like soon, like before the end of this month, let's just call it, is as a value add, a one-on-one -on -one session with me for $250. It's normally $325 for an hour with me. It's the same deal I give my 97 and up members. So if you sign up for this course right away, I will, I'll know, because I can see when you've signed up, I'll, and, and I'll throw in, you know, for only $250, a one-on-one -on -one session with me. So you can go through the course, you can ask the questions, you can use the community. In the one-on-one, -on -one, I'll log in with you remotely via Zoom. We can get real specific about your company or your client's company, whatever you want. You share your screen, I walk through your questions. I record that session and give you the video recording of that session afterwards. So now you have that to work with as well as an added resource. So three things to remember. Again, code BB25 gets you 25% off the price. 30-day money-back guarantee is always available. And the, the extra value add is the one hour one-on-one -on -one with me for only $250. So sign up and then reach out to me and say, Seth, I, how do I get my one-hour session with you? Obviously, I'll just confirm that you signed up for the course within the time frame. And, uh, and I'll send you a link for uh, and a coupon code for the one hour session that will get you the one hour for 250 instead of 325. And uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. That's all Thank I got. Thank you, Seth. That was, that was, all, that was, all, that was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That is all I got. So I'll send an email follow-up um, for everyone once the recording of this uh, webinar is, uh, is has rendered. And, uh, and I'll recap all those details and give you the links so you can check the outline and take advantage of the, uh, the discounts that I'm offering on this right now. I'll see you all. And we'll have another great webinar next week. I haven't decided on the topic yet, but I will have it figured out before the end of the day. Thank you. Bye.